if we ever go back in time, way back in time, and if we were to come back again to the present moments, we find that there is a very common streak that goes through all this period. A common factor that has always been there. And that uh, common uh, factor is us human beings have colossal capacity to uh, create chaos everywhere. And once in a while that chaos becomes so great that we cannot uh, get any solution from it. That's one of our great capabilities. That year, uh, ages and ages ago, again and again we bring ourselves into a mess from which we cannot extricate ourselves. And then wise people in the society get together and they sit down and ponder over it and very solemnly they declare this is what is known as the dark ages but they cannot find any solution to it. And it is at this moment that the advent takes place because now the solution lies only with God, not with human beings. And this is how advent takes place. And always the purpose of the advent is to make us realize that this is illusion and God is the reality. And in order to achieve that reality, love is needed. Again, uh, there is an irony to that, that uh, beloved Baba has always said, love me, love me more and more, more and more, because at, at this present moment, I am God in human form. And yet, ironically, divine love can never be had through force or compulsion. It is always a gift of God. And that gift of God is given only by constant remembrance of you, the beloved. And when that gift comes, then that the fire of love is kindled in us. And that is why a very great Urdu poet by the name of Mirza Ghalib has once declared, Ish par zor nahi ay Ghalib, e atish jalaye na jale, bujaye na buje. O oh Ghalib, there can be no force on divine love. This is one fire which you try to light, it cannot be lit. But once lit, it cannot be put off. This is the meaning of the divine love. And those who are fortunate enough to have it, even they sometimes fail to realize it. And there is a very beautiful story of a great saint in Gujarat, uh, somewhere in the 18th century. His name was Valya Bapa. And basically he was a farmer by profession. And because farming is a very, you know, hard task for us in India, because there is no such thing as mechanical machines and things, it's all done by manual labor and with the help of the animals. And Valya Bapa loved Lord Krishna very much and he would regularly pray to him. And he would request him that if I had a servant to help me in this farm work, then I would devote all my time to you. Sure enough, one day a young boy came to him and he says, I want a job. If you want, I'll serve you. And Valya Papa was very happy to have this young man. And the young man was working very nicely with him and all. He do each and every task that was needed on the farm. And Valya Papa devoted all his time to his beloved. Surprisingly, Valya Papa did not realize that this young man was none other but Lord Krishna who had come as a young man. And about a year passed by and one afternoon for some reason or the other, Valya Bapa went out for a stroll in his own farm. And to his utter surprise he found that all fun things were functioning normally. That young man was fast asleep under the shade of a tree. The animals were plowing the field. The bullets were drawing water from the well. Everything was going smoothly. <laughs> and Valya Bapa was surprised at this phenomenon. So he went to this young man and he woke him up and he says, Now tell me honestly who you are. And the young man said, You fool, it took you one year to realize who I am. <laughs> and you say you love me. Is this what you call love? And then he vanished. This is what it is. Our beloved Baba too has uh, in his lifetime shown us the uh, beauty of that love. I remember one incident where uh, some governor of South India sent a letter to beloved Baba saying that uh, I want to have your darshan. 
and Baba was not very happy about it. And he says, Beloved Baba, after all, he's an important man in the political field, this, that. Baba says, write to him on such and such a date, from nine in the morning to five after nine. That's the only time I'll give him darshan. So the sent letter was sent and his PA sent back the reply that uh, the governor will be present. Naturally, a governor of South India is coming to Maharashtra, so all arrangements were made for the security. Police guards were kept on the road. And one inspector was stationed right at the gate of Merazad, where the bus takes a turn to enter that open space. And uh, that particular day, beloved Baba came to the audience hall about 8.30 in the morning. And he sent Aloba to call that inspector. And the inspector came and Baba says to him, has the car arrived? He says, no Baba, not as yet. He's supposed to come at 9 o'clock. It is only 8.30 now. As soon as you sight the car, come and report to me. So he bowed down to Baba and left. Five minutes later, Baba sent again Aloba. Call him again. Did you see the car? No, not as yet. And this went on every five, ten minutes. And time passed by. It is now five after nine. And Baba called him and said, Well, no, he's not come as yet. Is he punctual? Now how could the inspector say to Baba that, Well, he's not. So he said, Maybe, Baba. And this went on. Every ten, fifteen minutes, Baba would call him to him and ask him the same question. Is he coming? When it is about eleven o'clock, time for the mandli to have the lunch, Baba called that inspector. And this time he told him to come inside. And then Baba gave him a tight embrace and it said, it's time for lunch. Have lunch with my manly people and then go. And then Baba told him, this whole show had been arranged by me for your sake. He is not coming. And the inspector burst into tears and began to cry like a child. And then when they went for the lunch, the manly people asked him, why did you cry? And he said, for the last seven to eight years, I have been striving to have Mayor Baba's darshan. But uh, I was told he is in seclusion. I was told no, he is out of Nagar. I am told he was there, this and what not. And I could never say him. But today, he gave me his darshan till my whole heart was satisfied. And as if that is not enough, he has given me permission to share food with his very close ones. That is the reason why I was crying. Soon after that, a letter came from the governor saying, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it that day. Could you, could you kindly give him one more chance to have your darshan? Baba said to Eretz, see, I told you to refuse it from the first time, but you insisted Baba give him a chance. Now what do we do? Baba said, give him such and such a date. Nine o'clock to five after nine. After that, finished. And this time, sure enough, he came. But before he came, Baba was again in his audience room, giving audience in the Monday hall. And uh, about 8.30 he told Eraj, hang that charge of evolution, that chart of evolution which he has given in our God speaks, hang it on the wall. And Eraj said, but Baba, there's five minutes, you can't explain to him all of this. Just hang it. Exactly sharp nine, the governor came there. And uh, he greeted Baba like this. And then his eyes fell on that chart opposite to Baba's chair. And he began to yap like a fool. Politicians normally are that. <laughs> anyway, oh, what a beautiful chart. The whole purpose of creation I understand and this and that. And I'm going to publish millions of such charts and I'll make exhibit them in each and every school in India and this and that. Looking at the chart, he kept on yapping away totally forgetting the creator was sitting there. He is looking only at that piece of paper. Exactly nine after, five after nine, Baba clapped and said, get out. And then when he left, Baba told Eraj, he was a hypocrite who had come to show his importance. He was a hypocrite who had come to show his importance and had to stoop to his level of hypocrisy to show him the chart of evolution. That was the only purpose. But there are others who are genuine. On one occasion, beloved Baba was giving darshan at Madras, public darshan. And a Madrasi gentleman came for darshan. 
The only reason why Hiraj remembered him was because of his height. Matras is normally not that high. Average is about 5-6, but this was well over 6-6 six, six or something. He stood up very prominently in the crowd. So he had Baba's darshan and then he left. Four o'clock in the evening after the program was over, Baba got in the car and he then tells Hiraj, come on, drive now. And we, Baba began to show him, go this way, that way and all. Till at last the car came to a movie house, a theatre, and Baba said, stop here. Baba got off the car and the manli followed him, rapidly entered the movie house, climbed the staircase, went to the second floor, and there opened one door and sat in the chair that was there. That was the only thing that was present in that, house, in that room. One chair and a picture of Lord Ram. And Eraj and the others followed him and they saw this and this tall madrasi. Eraj remembered him because of his head. He saw this madrasi sitting there meditating on that picture of Ram. And the madrasi was shocked to see Baba come and sit by that chair. As soon as he saw that he began to cry like a child, put his head on Baba's lap and kept on crying and crying and Baba kept on pacifying him all the time. When he had calmed down, Manli asked him, what is the reason behind this? And he said, from my very childhood, I had a great desire to have the darshan of Ram. But I never knew who was a genuine God man. <laughs> because in India, God men are a dime a dozen. So he did not know whom to believe or whom to accept. He, in his own way, decided to solve the problem when he built this movie house. On the second floor, he had kept one room exclusively for his Lord Ram. A chair was kept and the idea was that one man who without being informed about anything comes to this room and occupies the chair he is my Lord Ram. And this thing he had not only told his family members. And when he says beloved Baba sitting there all his doubts vanished and he accepted Baba as Ram. When God comes down on earth he comes for each and every one of us. Even for the, his dumb creatures, animals, everyone. And uh, this is a beautiful story narrated to us by Naja. Naja was in the Mandi and she was beloved by the cook. And uh, her cooking was so very delicious that I'm quite sure that no ch uh, chef from a five star hotel could equal her talent. That delicious. Dr. Harry Campbell even spoke to Baba saying, if you could give me permission, I would like to take Naja to America for my, you know, cooking and all. And Baba said, shut up, don't talk like an idiot. <laughs> and uh, the Baba group was somewhere in northern India and they had, they had rented a bungalow or something. Evenings, the dinner time for beloved Baba was very early, about six or so, everything would be over. And when the lights are switched on, Baba would occupy his chair and then sit down and chit chat. Just casual chit chat, nothing important, nothing spiritual. Once in a while, maybe if he was in a mood, he would do that. So on this particular day, a wall laser, I think you Americans call it gecko. Gecko or something. Anyway. Very big one, nearly 12 inches long from the head to the tip of the tail. This wall lizard climbed up the wall, tick tick, went up to the ceiling and let loose a drop of shit, which <laughs> fell on beloved Baba's head. Beloved Baba always had a small table next to him with a plastic container in case he wanted to wash his hands and all. A bottle of Odi Kolo and uh, a stack of handkerchiefs. One of the peculiarities was that he would use it once and then discard it. And the other reason for having so many handkerchiefs was sometimes he would give one to some of his lovers who had came, come to him for Russian or water. So he picked up uh, one of those handkerchiefs, cleaned it, threw it again, the conversation continued. Next day the same thing, and Najar recognized it because of its size. Tick, 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 went up, again let loose and the drop of shit fell on Baba's head. Nothing happened, the conversation is going on all the time. Then third night again the same thing. 
Now, this was the end of Naja's patience. Next day, she was ready with a long handled broom which could reach the ceiling, kept it near her chair. And on the fourth day, sure enough, that lizard stitched again went up on, that was on Baba's head. So, as soon as Naja saw that, no, on the fourth day, it, Naja did not give it a chance to do so. Naja grabbed that broom and charged. And Baba says, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? No. For the last three days, Baba, is, this lizard is, you know, letting loose on your head. Did I want to either kill it or drive it away? It doesn't bother me if a, a, a drop of shit falls my, on my head. It doesn't bother me at all. Why are you so much worried and upset about it? Sit down, put that broom down and sit down. Then she quietly sat down. And then Baba smiled and said, This lizard is less pain in my neck than you human beings. <laughs> Again in Northern India, in India, uh, early morning milk, uh, that, uh, that method of providing milk uh, still continues here. The milkman brings his animal right to your doorstep and milks it right before you. Mostly we have buffalo milk in India. Somewhere near Dehradun or some place, this milkman would come every day. And Naja being in charge of the kitchen, she would be the one to collect the milk. And uh, just casually the milkman says to Naja, one of my buffaloes is not feeling well. I'm going to take uh, my buffalo to the vet. He loved his buffaloes. He, he used to call them his children. <laughs> Naja had a brain wave. She says, look, don't bother about the vets or anything. I'll give you good medicine. It will definitely work. And she gave this milkman a little bit of Baba's Udi ashes, you know, collected from the, the white ashes. We, we call it uh, Udi, Udi we call it in Hindi. And I just said, take this Udi, apply it on the animal's forehead and next day the animal will be absolutely fit and normal. <laughs> Next day the man came and Naja says, how's the buffalo? <laughs> he said, the buffalo died at night. <laughs> but, and unfortunately another buffalo has got the same problem. Very hesitatingly Naja said, try that uh, baby again. <laughs> and he did it. Naja asked her, well, died last night. <laughs> And now the third buffalo has got the same problem. Very hesitatingly, Naja said, if you feel like it, try it. <laughs> and he tried it. And three buffaloes consecutively died. But this man was not burdened with any uh, external education like us people. He had never been to school or college or anything. He was just an average human being who lived very close to nature. And Naja said to him, I'm very sorry. My only intention was to help you. That something went wrong someplace. And look at the answer this man gives. Don't worry, mother. I know where my children have gone. Uh, don't worry, mother. Telling Naja, don't worry. I know where my children have gone. He knew about Mer Baba. And uh, who was providing the milk to. In uh, 68, no, I was in India in 1967, and that time beloved Papa was in very very strict seclusion, and I had a feeling that this time I may have to rejoin my ship without having Papa's touch. Otherwise, every time when my time came to go back to my sea job, he would call me for his darshan and then send me away. But in 67, I felt that this time I'll have to go without uh, seeing beloved Papa. But somewhere in, uh, I think October or November, it was tail end of uh, 67, Baba called uh, Gaimai, that is Eret Jasavala's mother, my mother and me, to Meraza, afternoon time. And we were all sitting there, Baba greeted us all. And then Baba says to me, just uh, a day or so before, I sent a very important circul circular to all my lovers, in, the, in, in India as well as in the West. 
and the content of the circular was that none of you should you know correspond with me write to me send any telegram nothing at all should be uh, sent to me even if someone very near and dear to you dies don't disturb me and that's the content of the circular that i have sent but remember one thing no first he asked me when is your leave getting over this was in november so i told him that my leave ends on the 9th of february 1968 and uh, i said but baba i think i'll prolong my stay in india because 25th is your birthday so baba always very practical in every respect first thing he asked me is if you prolong your leave for these many days will it be a paid leave or an unpaid leave i said no baba this will be unpaid leave who knows whether my birthday will be celebrated or not go back when as soon as your leave expires on the 9th join your ship but before you join that ship do one thing at least 3 or 4 days before the 21st of february 1968 inform me about your whereabouts oh sir yes ma'am and then every 5 10 minutes he would interrupt his conversation with other people don't forget at least 3 or 4 days before the 21st of february inform me about your whereabouts the entire itinerary of your ship and till the time he told us to depart he kept on repeating even as i was stepping out of the manli hall don't forget then inform me and uh, he had mentioned that in that circular also i have given out that uh, all this while i have been saying that the black cloud is coming coming but now i am saying it has come so i when i stepped out i was thinking to myself maybe beginning of the third world war or something i know those were my thoughts and then i went and then ninth i went to the uh, our agents in bombay and they sent uh, they flew me to egypt alexandria because that was where my ship was it, uh, that was a british uh, british company ship and uh, i reached there on the 12th or the 13th of february and on the 17th of february we sailed and the voyage was that we sailed from alexandria go over to dakar senegal republic for bunkers fresh water oil fruit like everything then from there to cape town cape town to durban durban to mombasa mombasa to bombay that was the whole trip so on 18th i sent a telegram because i myself was the wireless operator so i sent a telegram giving out this entire reports uh, of call i started my sea career in the year 1950 and uh, for two years i was so engrossed with my sea life enjoying so thoroughly that somewhere in 1952 again october or november i get the first letter from my beloved papa written by eraj those letters are still there with uh, eraj they want to put them in the archive it's not over so there in baba says uh, right as uh, eraj writes that beloved baba wants to know what has happened to his son because for the last two years he has not sent him a single letter he has never sent him birthday greetings nothing as he becomes so very important a man in eden there was a parsi uh, gentleman by the name of tinsha uh, eden wala he was a very very rich businessman he was known as the uncrowned king of eden nearly every business he had a hand in it so baba says uh, writes in that letter tells eraj to write in the letter as sam kera wala now suddenly becomes sam eden wala <laughs> <laughs> anyway, from that time onwards, I had made it a habit to send my beloved Papa birthday greetings on 18th of February. So since I was sending this telegram, I included the birthday greetings also. Just to digress for a little bit, 1969, I'll say I sailed from that uh, some Texas port in America, Mobile, and we are going to Norway with a load or something. I don't forget all that. and we reached norway on the 22nd of february and like as usual i sent the greetings telegram to my beloved papa it was then that eraj and the manli knew that sam it does not even know that papa has dropped his box so i'm talking about papa himself 2 days before 24 days 
Anyway, so that was the reason why I included the greetings also. Then we set sail, uh, went through the Straits of Gibraltar, came to the coast of uh, Northwest Africa, and by that time the Atlantic was very, very rough. February, the month of February, those areas are always like that. And since as a wireless operator, it was my job to get the weather report regularly. So we started getting gale warning, severe gale, storm, this, that. And eventually it came to, I think what Americans call uh, typhoon or uh, hurricane. Uh, we call it cyclone, cyclonic warning. And because the sky was overcast, we could not take a proper bearing and fix the position of the ship. And we took a turn going to Dhaka. And exactly at 8 in the morning on 31st of February, the ship ran aground full speed uh, on a reef. And right from 4 to half, the entire bottom was ripped open, including the double uh, bottom tanks wherein we store fuel oil and water and all. So uh, we started contacting here. Uh, nearby ports, Malta, Gibraltar, where there are facilities for dry docking and all, but they flatly refused because everyone is worried that, you know, oil leakage would spoil the waters and all that. The closest port to us was Casablanca, about 80 miles away. So, I called them on VHF telephone and they said, unless and until human life is in danger, we won't uh, take you in. This is low tide and the whole day the ship was being, you know, banging on the reefs all the time. About 8 o'clock at night when the high tide came, the ship floated. So the chief engineer went down, tried the engines, the one stroke and the engine started. And we all thought that, thank God, nothing much has happened. But in less than half an hour's time, chief engineer came and said, uh, engine room is being flooded with water and the pumps can't cope up with it. We must do something. So then again we called Casablanca and they said, don't worry, we are sending a deep sea salvage tug. You steam on your own. And then once the tug sights you, we'll throw the line and tow you inside. And next uh, morning or so, we went to Casablanca. And then they put those small boys so that uh, the oil seepage would not pollute the entire harbor water. Next morning, the, the, you know, the rigmarole started. Agents came, insurance man came, this, that. Now to judge how much damage has been done, the cargo loaded in Alexandria, Egypt, was being discharged. And as the cargo was being discharged, the side plates of the ship began to fall down because all the rivets had broken. In the meantime, we were all seated in cap captain's cabin, enjoying a drink because of our safe uh, arrival in port. We were very happy about it because the tension was over. And this insurance man came in and he says to the captain, Captain, it is entirely a miracle that the ship reached Casablanca because as the cargo is being unloaded, entire plates are falling off into water. We do not understand how the plates remained in position. One of the junior engineers was a, a Hindu gentleman and uh, he said, I know the reason. I have never eaten beef in my life. But I knew the real reason. And that uh, idiot's talk irritated me. So I said, no, that cannot be. That can never be. Because I have eaten so much beef in my lifetime that it would suffice you as well as me. Not eating beef is not possible. <laughs> And then I sat down and wrote a detailed letter to beloved Baba and soon a cable came from Baba that uh, your uh, telegram with the birthday greetings and the ship's uh, itinerary received by me. Uh, don't worry, my love and blessings to all of you on that particular ship. He would respond to each and every feeling that is there in our heart. Again, I was home on leave. Uh, I don't remember the year. Now, when beloved Baba would be in uh, Guru Prasad, Eretch would be with Baba for the entire day. 
Till in the evening, Eraj would make beloved Baba comfortable in his bedroom and then Baba would tell him to go home. Because that way, Eraj's mother Gaima too would get the pleasure of her son's company, who was all the time the beloved Baba. So Baba told Eraj, Sam is arriving today. Tomorrow morning, you both come to Guru Prasad together and you know, spend the whole day and then in the evenings go back to Bindra house. That was the name of the Eraj's house in Pune. So, Eraj told me to be ready early in the morning and those days Eraj and I we were quite young and fit so we would walk over from Bindra house to Guru Prasad, about 30-35 minute walk. And it was good for me because I would ask Eraj questions and he would answer me many things there. Now this is my very first day in Guru Prasad and the routine began. Baba would come. The best part of that beginning was beloved Baba entering the audience hall. And the Lord would come and stand by his chair and with his hands folded, he would bow down to each and every one who was present there. And this bowing was not some show like what politicians do when they require votes for their election and all. It was a genuine bowing down of great love. And in my heart I would once in a while have a feeling that would, but sometimes his face would be very solemn, as if there was some pain also there. And in my heart, this was my feeling, remember that, not all. And in my heart of hearts I would feel that maybe this is because he says to himself, you bloody fools, when will you wake up? The very door of eternity is stand right there before you. All you have to do is enter that door if you have enough courage in you to do so. That was mine. And then we would also bow down to him. And then as he's sitting down, in the very motion of sitting down, he would make gesture and so we all would. But of course we would sit down only when he had you know, become comfortable in the chair. And then the routine would become, Eraj would read the mail. All English letters were read by Eraj. Uh, Marathi letters were read by uh, Balnatu. Hindi letters were read by uh, uh, Uncle Churi, our chairman. Like that it would continue. Most of the time Baba would just listen to the letter because they had become well conversant in how to reply it. Only some very delicate points then Baba would say. And then from that points given, Beloved Baba would complete, uh, they would complete the letter. After that, uh, Eraj would start reading the newspaper of that day. And because uh, holding the paper now, Eraj cannot see Beloved Baba. So how to indicate to Eraj that, come on, continue further. Eraj would start reading the headlines. Baba would snap his fingers, that means jump the article. Another headline, jump the article, like that. And the whole paper would be over in about two minutes time. Eraj would fold it and Baba, once I remember looking at me and says to me, bogus news period is over. <laughs> then once in a while he would say, come on, let's have a game of cards. But this morning, by that time it was nearly 9.30 or so. And uh, Baba stood up, so naturally we all stood up immediately. I did not know what was happening. So I asked Pandu, I said, Pandu, what is happening? And then Pandu Kaka told me that because of Baba's two accidents, the doctors had advised him an exercise. So Baba would be taken in a car to a certain area in Pune, which is called the Southern Command area, where the Southern Command Army is stationed there. That area is very peaceful, very quiet, and because it's an army area, very neat, clean and tidy. So Baba would go to the end of that road, he would get off the car, walk that road, come to the other end. In the meantime the car would come and wait for him at the other end. And then Baba would get into the car and come back to Guru Prasad. That's what Pandu told me. A thought came to my mind that if I could ride in the car with my beloved Baba, I would boast before posterity that I had a drive with the Lord. But I said to myself, these are giants over here. They are manly and after all the big giants. And I said to myself, I am like a blooming prawn over here, a small fish. So, 
But even as I'm thinking this, there was a shout, Sam! It was Erech's voice. So I was non, completely non-plustered. Then this is, Erech is calling you, so I ran out. And when Baba's work is involved, Erech becomes very impatient and angry. Come on, don't waste time, get in the car. <laughs> so, I got in the front seat. Erech got from the other round, round he got to the driver's seat and Baba sat next to me. And the drive began. That time I totally forgotten about that thought of mine, but later on I remember that hardly had that thought been completed, Baba immediately responded to that thought. And from that moment I said to myself, my thought was that uh, I can boast before posterity that I had a right with God. If he were not God, he would not have responded. But because he is what he is, he responded. 1954, when I first came to India, Beloved Baba was in Satara at that time, and some very beautiful stories are connected with that place, Satara. One is of uh, his very close disciple, Aga Bhaitu. Uh, he was known as the one who, like you know, those Alsatian dogs, specially trained to sniff drugs and all that. Aga Baidul was a, a, a complete master in uh, finding out musk. Uh, a very noble man, Aga Baidu, and giant of a man, very strong man. If he were to give me one slap, I wouldn't be there to receive the other one. That strong man. And very sturdy also. <laughs> One day at Satara, <laughs> he must have gone out some place and on the sidewalk he saw a, a, a chap selling old books. No one would even look at them. He <laughs> looked at it and he picked up his very thin volume of uh, homeopathic drugs. And he paid I think something like 50 paise for it. And he read it <laughs> and he had a brilliant brain view. Tomorrow I will sit under the shade of the tree outside the house where the man monthly was staying and I will start reading uh, Sikh people. That will be a good service to uh, the Levit Babas. So, next morning he is there with a stool, that book in his hand and a few uh, homeopathic medicines and uh, he started prescribing drugs. And sure enough, people were getting cured. Till uh, the ma uh, this uh, matter reached the civil surgeon of the government hospital, whose daughter had some particular skin skin problem which could not be solved by the best of allopaths. So he comes to Aga Baidun and he looked at it, prescribed the drug, and she was cured. Mind you, this was not because of Aga Baidun, but because the hand behind it was the hand of the Lord. But now Baba doesn't like all this and he has to bring this out. The subject must come out in the open so that he can stop it. How to do that? So that particular night when they were all men manly, but you know, sitting there, they had their dinner very early and chit-chatting and someone casually men mentioned it would be wonderful if we could have hot jilebis, a particular type of Indian sweet meat. Uh, very delicious. If we could have some jilebis, it would be wonderful. Even before that said that, there was a knock at the door. And Erech is the one who handles all this, so he went out. And there was a man, well dressed uh, here, and he had a tray in his hand and he says, the civil surgeon has sent the hot jilebis for the doctor over here. So Nilu, Dr. Nilu, who died in the 1956 accident, he thought it was for him. So he goes, yes, I'm the doctor here. No, he says, no, 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 no not you. Then Dr. Donkin thought, maybe he's talking about me. So Don goes ahead. He says, no, not you. Then Ere says, there is no other doctor over here. The doctor with the beard. And then Aga Baidul heard it, so he came charging. You do not understand anything. Ah, Dr. Saab, please take this. Sir. And they all enjoyed it thoroughly. And next morning Baba came at his usual time to them. You want to change? Uh, uh, next morning Baba came, sat down, and all the all knowing one played his game of not knowing anything perfectly. That we were a good sleep. No headache, nothing. Anything important happened last <laughs> last night? Well naturally you have to tell Baba. So he says, Baba. Civil surgeon's man came and he had brought us a tray of hot chilebis. 
and you didn't inform me about it because nothing should enter the ashram without Baba's permission. Well, well, we just had a very... Then why did he send it? He said, Nere said it was for the doctor. Me? <laughs> Nere said no. Nobody knows everything, but you know, was it for you? No, <laughs> he says, it was for Aga Baidul. Aga Baidul is a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> then he asked him, what happened? Baba, he found this book on the sidewalk. I bought it for 50 paisa. And after that, I've been treating people and they're all getting cured. Baba was very angry. He said, you fool. This is all right that my women got cured, but supposing someone had died, it is not you who would be responsible. I would have to go to Kalapush for that. Because you are not an authorized registered doctor. Stop it immediately. And he took that book and tore it away. And that was the end of the whole episode. <laughs> this is how we would bring out this text right there. <laughs> Once Baba was in Hamirpur, and uh, it is more like uh, what I'm trying to uh, do my, my level best is, beloved is like a, a scintillating diamond, which is different facets. And these are the ways, uh, these stories illustrate his infinite greatness. So in Hamirpur, Baba is sitting with his closed ones, and he casually asked, what did it uh, take me to be? Someone said, you are Ram, some Krishna, this, that. But there was one chap who was very honest about it. And he says, I cannot accept you as God. But I feel in my heart of hearts that you are a great man. And Baba again with his beautiful sense of humor. And yet teaching him also. He says, very good. Now remember one thing. The day you come across one greater than me, immediately let go of me and follow that man. <laughs> there could be no one greater than him. Like that. There was a, a lover of Baba who was in the army and uh, he was transferred to the Himalayan range, what we call the Saichan Glacier, Pakistan and India, you know that uh, disturbance. So that glacier was where he was stationed, an extremely remote place where mail, telegrams, all things this very very late like. About a week before, Erich is reading a letter to beloved Baba, and the name of that man was some, I forget his name. So Baba stopped Erich and says to him, is that that man, you know that he is in the army and all? And Erich said, no Baba, this is a different man, the name is the same, but he is a different man. Oh. Read on. Again a wee while later, you sure he is not that man? Erich said, no Baba. This is another man. I know whom you are referring to. He is stationed somewhere in the Himalayas, away from his family. And by the way, you know, no, he cannot remember the man, but he remembers it's his birthday on such and such a date. This he remembered. <laughs> and he tells him, you know, his birthday is on this particular day. Send him a take, uh, telegram that, uh, you know, my love and blessings on your birthday, Mayor Baba. There at that end, in that very remote place, that Saichan Glacier, this man is sitting down all by himself a day before his birth and thinking to himself, does anyone remember me, my family and all? Will they at all remember me? That tomorrow is my birthday, I'm all alone, this, that. And he's sitting there. Next morning dawns, nothing from his family. At 8 o'clock sharp, because it is God's will, so now the telegram also reaches right time that uh, when the you know, truck or something came with the mail and everything and the telegram also. And he opened the telegram and started crying. My family did not remember me, but my mom did. My love and blessings to you on your birthday. We'll switch over to some Sufi stories.
everything a master does is always for the good of his uh, disciples. Everything. And uh, once we have surrendered to him, his one and only concern is our welfare. And this is a story of Junaid, who was the Kutub Ishad, the head of the hierarchy in Baghdad at that time. So, one Friday morning, Junaid told his disciples, Come on, let's go, we have to go to the marketplace in Baghdad. Now in those days, and I think that system still continues in Saudi Arabia, Yemen and other places. Friday morning, the first prayer, after that the criminals are brought out from the prison and the sentence is carried out, right in the open public. And uh, even the beheading is done in the public. And uh, 1954 or 56, in Yemen, a port called Hodeida, my ship was there. I got photographs taken of this public execution, which I sent over to Merazad also. Anyway, so Junet took his disciples to the marketplace. And on that particular day, a thief had been hanged for his crime. And there is a huge crowd, you know, human beings, they like to enjoy such fun. So Junet neglected the whole crowd. He went straight to the scaffold where the uh, thief was hanged and he very humbly bowed down to the thief. And there was an immediate consternation in the crowd that a man like Junaid bowing down to a common thief and very snide remarks were made about Junaid, things like that. The disciples heard all that and they were very much upset by such remarks spoken about their master. Junaid did not bother and they went back to their ashram. Unlike beloved Baba, that total democracy rules, in those days with Sufi masters, unless and until the master gives a permission, you cannot speak to him. A couple of days later, seeing that the master was in a very good humor, the chief disciple said, Master, I have a question to ask. He says, Go ahead. And he said, Master, Friday you took us to the marketplace in Baghdad, and there you bowed down to that common thief. And people were making very snide and rude remarks about you. And we too were very much upset. Why should you do a thing like that, bow down to a common thief? And Junet said, what people say about me is none of my concern. My concern is the pure welfare at all times. I'll tell you why I bow down to that thief. That thief gave up his life for his profession. You all sitting here profess yourselves to be lovers of God, seekers of the truth. Something much more is expected of you than a common thief. That's why I bow down. Another story I remember is about uh, how beloved Baba has taught us that if we are fortunate enough to remember it at the moment of death, then he has given us his uh, divine promise that I shall free you from the rounds of work and death. So there was this one man, a very rich businessman, always occupied with his business. So he approached a wise man. He did not know that that wise man was a Sufi master. And he told him, Master, this is my problem, I'm a Muslim, but I'm so engrossed in my business and making money that I have no time to offer my five times prayers a day. I cannot fast, is that I cannot observe any of the rules and tenets of the Islamic religion. And the master said, uh, do you conduct your business all 24 hours? He said, no. Uh, do you conduct your business when you go to the toilet? He said, no. Do you conduct your business when you go to the bathroom for your bath? No. Well, he says, that, that's the answer to your problem. From now on, when you are in the toilet and in the bathroom, those are the times that you must remember your law. Forget about uh, 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 reciting prayers five times a day. Forget about fasting in Ramzan. Just do this much. And the man liked the idea. This was very easy for him to carry out. And he took the words of that man deeply to his heart. And from that day onwards, in the toilet or in the bathroom, he would constantly remember the law and with his own heart and being. And time passed by and maybe pressure of work or something, he had a stroke and went into coma. His sons knew that their father was deeply devoted to that wise man, so they approached him and they said to him, this is the case, can you help my, our father? 
And the man said, yes, I can help him. But the outcome will not be according to your liking, but it will be of great advantage to your father. They said, that is all we want. Come on, take me home. So they took the master home. And when he arrived there, he gave orders that two buckets of hot water be made ready. And when the hot water was made ready, he ordered the father to be carried to the bathroom. They made him sit there. And he started pouring the hot water on the man. The orders of the master had gone so deep into his consciousness that even in that state of coma, as soon as he felt the hot water falling on him, automatically within him he started repeating the name of the Lord. Because those were the orders. When you are in the bathroom, remember your beloved. And the master kept on pouring hot water on him, and the two buckets were over, and he died. And the master said, my job is over. All I can tell you now is that your father has run the round. Forget about his death and death. Always, they take care of us, always. Now, there are, uh, last uh, Wednesday, our Judith told me about, uh, you know, something of the similarity of the advance. And uh, there are more similarities. One of them I noticed was uh, the way the Lord walks on His domain, this whole creation. And those of us who have read the book by Khalil Gibran, Jesus the Son of Man, in that there is a, a chapter devoted to Maria Magdalene. And uh, she sees Jesus walking. And in that uh, she says that uh, I did not know whether this man was walking or running. I did not know whether his feet even touched the earth. It appeared to me like he was floating on the air. And his whole being moved in total rhythm with each other. None of their limbs were, you know, outside of it. Everything was just perfect. And merely seeing him walk uh, sent uh, waves of joy and thrill in my heart. Same with Lord Buddha. Uh, during the time of Lord Buddha, there was a decoy by the name of uh, Ungali Mal. This man used to rob the travelers and chop off their small fingers and make a garland of it and hang it round his neck. Ungali means a finger and Mal means a garland. That was his habit. But the time had come for his salvation. So, for many days he didn't find a victim. And he was looking for a victim. And Lord Buddha one day told his disciples, For certain reasons of my own, today I am going to go alone. No one must follow me. Even Anand, his close disciple, was told not to come with him. So Lord Buddha passed by that, uh, that road where this uh, decoy used to hang around. And from top of the hill he saw this man walking slowly. He came charging down. And he began to follow him. If he walked fast, Lord Buddha would be the same distance away. If he was slow, Lord Buddha would be the same distance away. He couldn't understand what was happening. No matter how hard he tried to catch up with him, he could not do so. Out of sheer desperation he shouted, Hey monk, stop! And Lord Buddha stopped and said, Hungli man, I am always at rest. It is you who are in motion. And till such time that you do not come to rest, we can never catch up with you. These were his words. And then Hungli man asked him who he was. And he said, I am Siddhartha Gautam Buddha. And he fell at his feet. And became Lord Buddha's very close disciple. And in that very lifetime, he made payment for all his crimes and sins. And Lord Buddha gave him salvation. The same with our beloved. Uh, early years, 1954, when he had called me for that Savas. Those days on the ship I had an 8mm movie camera. And I got that stretch of movie. Beloved Baba coming down the hill from his Samadhi. And uh, the same thing. The speed, the grace of walking and all. So it appears as if that uh, his style of walking has always remained the same as and when he comes down in his creation. Not only that, but once Eraj drew my attention that even in minor details, 
the similarities very much. Like for instance with Lord Jesus, his master was uh, John the Baptist. He was a giant of a man, very hot temper. If he lost his temper, he would not hesitate to use offensive language even. He would even raise a stick and hammer people. And another thing about John the Baptist was that he never wore, wore clothes. He would cover himself with a burlap sack. Like, and Eraj took, this is what he told me. Remember I told you that each day we would go walking from Bindra house to Guru Prasad. These were the stories he would narrate to me. And Eraj said, look at it. Upasi Maharaj, giant of a man. Very hot tempered. Can use offensive language that can shame even the worst scoundrel in the world. <laughs> and and uh, always dressed in that burlap sack. Nothing like that. Eraj has many a times told us uh, in the Manli Hall that it is only because of sorrow that we remember our beloved. In the times of joy and happiness we tend to forget him. So sorrow is very important. And because of sorrow we understand the value of uh, happiness and joy. Unless and until we feel the pain we cannot see the other side of the coin. A rich man was traveling in a ship with one of his slaves. Now this slave had never seen an ocean, let alone sit in a ship. So as soon as the uh, ship uh, set sail, he was very much frightened. And he began to cry and moan. And you know, went on and on till the passengers on that sailing ship were absolutely fed up with him. They did not know how to keep him shut. There was an old man sitting there observing all this. And the people were saying, for God's sake, do something. We can have some peace at least. Otherwise, this voyage will be horrible. And the old man said, I can help you out. And they said, please do so. He gave orders that the slave should be picked up and thrown in the sea. So they picked him up and threw him in the sea. After a couple of dunkings in the water, the master said, now call him up and put him on the ship. So he was pulled up and made to sit back. And he was absolutely calm and happy and quiet. And the people asked the master, what's the secret behind it? Till the man did not know the fears of drowning, he did not know the security of the ship. <laughs> and uh, one more story. I got six dogs to you know, my children to take them out. First. <laughs> Again, the same thing. This is how Sheikh Saadi, another great master, entered the path. In those days, uh, people used to travel in sailing ships and most of the business was done between Arabia and India because India was a land full of fabrics, spices, colors, all that. And uh, Arabia was a land full of uh, such things as dry fruits and all, dates, uh, pistachio arm and all that. So they would bring over the dry fruits to India and they would carry. Mostly it was not uh, money exchange, it was more like a barter system like that. So, the traveling was always done by rich businessmen. But one day, just as the ship was about to set sail, a very strange looking man went on board. Very humbly dressed, nothing at all. And they were all wondering, what is this man doing over here? Anyway, the ship set sail. And because this man sat quietly, not interfering with anyone, uh, other passengers felt that, well, this is a good chance to while away the time. So they started fooling with this man, making snide remarks, rude remarks, this, that. But he was absolutely calm as a lake, totally undisturbed and all. Unfortunately, that very thing irritated the passengers more and more. And uh, they even now started touching his person. Till one of them went up to him, gave him a tight slap and tore that whatever flimsy robe he was wearing, he tore it to pieces. And now a voice was heard, not by others, but by this man, that had they fooled with me, now this is God speaking directly, had they insulted me or fooled with me, that would be nothing, I wouldn't care and hang for it. But when anyone does things like that to my lover, that I cannot tolerate. 
give me the word and I'll sink the ship immediately. And the man said, oh my Lord, just for my sake so many human lives should be lost. No, I do not want that. And the Lord said that, uh, in that case, uh, tell me and I'll sing that man alone who slapped you and tore your garment to pieces. And he said, no, don't do that either. And the Lord said, some punishment must be meted out. I have to do something. They went too far with you. And look at the nobility of that man. This reminds me of the words of Socrates, telling his disciple Plato, when Plato made arrangements for him to escape the prison, Socrates tells Plato, Plato, I am not afraid to die, because intentionally or unintentionally, I have never harmed any living being. That is the greatness of these masters. So anyway, God says, some punishment must be meted out. The man said, if you would want to punish him, then do one thing. There the veil of ignorance that covers him. No sinner said it was done. And then man, that man realized, this is no ordinary man, he is the beloved of Allah. He came running to him, fell at his feet, begged him to forgive him. And then he became his disciple. And that disciple who became the disciple of that man was none other but Sheikh Sadi, who eventually became a great poet in his own way.